Okay, let's uh, move on now and look a little bit at uh, improving the pace of reform. Uh, Damien, I'm going to turn to you, pick on you this time. Um, we've talked a lot about uh, standards so far and the um, <clears throat> important role that standards bodies play. Um, do you think that anybody else has a role to play apart from the regulators? Do you think, for example, that there's enough technology um, in this space or that the technology providers could do more? I think that there's... There's enough technology in place right here, right now, for what we need to do, yeah? And what we're talking really is, is a shift here, are we? You know, quite a shift in the way we're thinking about things and where ideally the market would go to. And there I would say probably the technology isn't ready yet, which is no fault necessarily of the technology companies because they're not quite sure what they're aiming at in the first place. And until those standards start to coalesce, to settle down a bit, and then it will allow the vendors to you know, mm. potentially commoditize certain aspects globally. So I don't think the technology is quite there yet because it's not really sure where that technology needs to be aimed at. Mm -hmm. if that makes sense. Outrageous, Philippe. What do you say to that? <laughs> well, <laughs> um, happy to <laughs> full debrief on, on our technology plans. Um, our, our goal is to, to basically increase the, the, the throughput. I mean, STP has become a bad word, but we, we, we're, we're striving to, to implement STP within the within the, uh, the industry. And our view is that. Um, there's still a lot of a lot of um, room to to improve the ways. I mean, you're, you're around 16% of trade breaks, and the the, the, the spend the waste to, at the industry level is enormous. So I think if we can come in there and, and streamline the whole process by by helping with the creation of uh, standards for managing reference data, managing counterparty data and SSIs, and managing the, the trade process management. We, we can we can save you enormous amount of money. Okay, but the point Damien made was that he said that perhaps the vendors didn't know what they were aiming for, and that obviously you would believe that you have a very clear sense of what you have to provide, but what would your repose be to Damien's point, that you wouldn't know what you were aiming for? Well, we, we're aiming at, uh, at providing a high level of efficiency in, in the marketplace. Mm -hmm. And uh, again, my, my, my point is about you can have the best system in the world. You, you, there's a lot of other people in the world who, who don't have we don't have best of system, we, we simply cannot afford it. Again, that, that $500 million hedge fund, <laughs> the budget is a minute fraction of yours, right? And so you have this imbalance that will always be there. And if you look at the, the fragmentation marketplace, you have enormous fragmentation uh, within, the, within the banks themselves, but you know, enormous fragmentation with the vendors, which doesn't help either. So I think the, the, the answer is, is there's, a lot of, there's probably too, too, too many technologies to choose from, and that creates more fragmentation that's needed. And uh, I, think, I think some of the vendors have kind of lost their way in terms of where they want to go. Mm -hmm. But we, we hope that we have a very clear <laughs> mission ahead of us. And I mean, we, we have a very good relationship with, uh, with Swift, for example. We, we implemented our on-demand service directly on Swift network. Uh, we, we're trying to eliminate uh, waste, basically, and, and uh, increase the throughput. Mm -hmm. Obviously, we've talked about standards. Um, but just because you create the standard, does that make you an agent of change, right? So there's creating the standard, but then there's adoption. So how do you force adoption? Mm, yeah, indeed, and, and exactly the point we were referring to earlier on. Uh, and I think just to, I'll just answer that, it, just to backtrack, I think uh, that the pure technology, um, as in the capability of technology, exists today. I think, I think that, in general, yeah. exists today. And you can do a bit more with it, but the, 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 the leading edge of technology is pretty advanced. So that, that exists. It's not so much the pure technology. If you look at the how do you uh, make change really happen, there's the processes, there's the data we referred to earlier on, there's the structures and the policies, there's a whole range of dimensions that you need to get right, uh, as much as the technology, to make the, change, to, to make the change really happen. And it's that holistic, integrated change that is always ultimately successful. Uh, just driving it for technology's sake is usually not very successful, um, as we've seen in, in many cases. So I think that's, that's one point. Going back to the adoption, though, of uh, standards, um, t technology plays an important part. Um, and uh, the easy availability of easy-to-use technology, I think, is a very important uh, factor. And what we are seeing is, particularly for maybe not the leading, the top edge players, um, is the easy adoption of technology either through uh, software as a service, which I think is something that, of course, you know, uh, SmartStream is applying, but so are many others. Um, the infrastructure around things like, you know, cloud computing. So you don't need, you know, massive data centers anymore. You can, you can, you can bring uh, the, the, the capacity, processing capacity in. Um, and software applications which are easy to use and easy, easy to implement. That's become a very big feature, I think, of the adoption of standards. Okay, I want to uh, bring Andrew in on this. Um, so we've talked about the challenges relating to the sort of specifics of reference data um, may or may not relate to the technology that is available. 
culturally speaking, um, are there obstacles in the back office in terms of pushing forward change? Are you having to battle with egos or um, with budget cuts and, and the like? Can you shed any more light on internally what the challenges Ooh, might be? All of those. Um, I mean, it's always, you know, it's it's a compromise as to where you're going to, you know, invest your 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 your, your dollars, your time, your energy, which bits of the organisation you want to change. Whether it's focusing on more changing the trading models, whether it's coming into the, you know, into the back offices. Um, I think there's so many potential variables. You know, at BMP, we have recently, you know, purchased 75% of Fortis in um, in Belgium. That's a massive factor on what we're doing at the moment, and that's something very local to BMP, which wouldn't be affecting Namur or ING. Mm -hmm. Mind you, they've got their own sort of <laughs> challenges. Um, I think the only hard driver of, of change in the mid and the back office world is when you have volume constraints or control constraints. Um, cost, cost, cost does drive change, but I think not as much as control or volumes. If you can do it but it's expensive, it still kind of tends to get done. It's if you can't do it or it's unacceptable controls, then people say, right, we need to, we need to change this area. Mm -hmm. uh, Mark, can I get, get your views on the issues that you've heard over? Yeah, I mean, you've got to remember this, this industry that we're working in is a front office driven industry mm -hmm. and uh, traditionally the front office hold the, uh, the budgets. Um, they're the ones that drive changes in terms of new instrument types that come to market um, and consequently middle back office uh, always has to adapt and change for those demands. Um, some of the firms that we're speaking to at the moment uh, are explaining that given the changes in, in headcounts across the industry recently, uh, and a lot of that coming out of the middle back office, um, they are under strain. Um, and I guess their main concern is that um, without the investment in technology, um, without considering outsourcing, which we'll come on to, that when volumes do return, uh, which they're already starting to uh, in the front office, then actually the middle back office is going to be uh, ill-prepared to deal with that. Um, so technology has a role to play, absolutely, but I, I think I think that budgets ultimately still drive these decisions and regulators can make all of the changes they like, but ultimately if the budget still sits with the front office, it's going to be difficult for middle back office to adapt. I think it would be helpful, what's missing in the industry is a, a real benchmark. I mean, looking by geography, by asset class, the end-to-end -end cost of trade. And then have a ranking. I mean, basically, you rank all the banks, rank all the, the big hedge funds, and see who is efficient. And, and then, out of that, you, you can and you can look at how okay, my cost per trade is X dollars for UK equities, and I see my competitors was half that. And so maybe I have a problem. But that's I mean, there's no there's no such benchmark. So mm -hmm. I, I think that that's really um, I mean, that's, that's make, makes it very very hard for for the industry to evolve when you don't know what you, you, there's no there's no such benchmark. Mm -hmm. I mean, is there even enough information on the cost per trade out there in the marketplace? Well, there's limited information at, at the top end, right? There's a, there's a limited group. I mean, uh, McLagan is doing a study every year, but it's a very limited group of uh, banks, right? I, I think it's something we have to keep trying to do, because if you get it right, it's hugely beneficial. But comparing costs is so hard because it's it's seems to be impossible to determine you know what's what's included in that cost is your premises costs included is your power cost well actually mm -hmm. you've got your data center in new jersey processing your trades in tokyo well you know where do you put these costs and depending on where you put them do the you know where do the competition put them and you suddenly just get a bunch of numbers that Mm -hmm. Sort of interesting, <laughs> but can't really tell you whether you are efficient or not. So globalisation has obviously um, made it more complex to really understand your cost structure. Is that a fair assumption? I, I think globalisation <laughs> certainly has, but I think even if you weren't globalised, you'd have a problem to... I mean, it's, for years people talk about you know, the, the cost of a trade, what is the cost of a trade, and even if you just sort of say strip out some of the things that Andrew said about your New Jersey data centre processing for Tokyo and just said, right, just take the back office, the building or whatever and simple things like that, you will still come up with different answers in different organisations, you know, no matter how much you simplify it down. And I think that's where, you know, we're going to have our problems in the future. And I think it, it really is interesting what you said there, because I do believe that the, there is this morphing between front and back, we call it middle office, but then it is more yeah, of sure. a middle office, I think, these days that we're talking about. Sure. And they are very interested because, you know, if we can save money, they make more money, yeah? Sure. A dollar spent, you know, dollar saved is a dollar on your P&L, basically speaking, yeah? 
And so, yeah, it, it's a huge driver for efficiency. Sure. And the front office are interested because, obviously, they want to make more money for mm -hmm. well-known reasons, yeah? Mm -hmm. And they do take a strong interest yeah. going forward, I think. Yeah. But I don't think we're going to get to a cost and be able, you know, that will be universally agreed mm -hmm. and people will be at your rank and tables yeah. and all that. Because sometimes you might not want that to be there in the first place, yeah? You may have a very, very smooth, efficient operation that you don't want necessarily to have your competitors come and chase and go, oh, look, you know, BMPP can do it for a tenth of the price of ING, for example. You know, would BMPP want that out there when they can just sort of you know, bring clients on board on that basis? So it's a nice idea, but with league tables comes competition. Mm -hmm. And some people might not wish, you know, would sort of more covertly rather than overtly sort of run that competition, I would suggest. Mm -hmm.